Hey, folks, John Stewart returns to TV to host a live comedy benefit on HBO. It's the night of too many stars. America unites for autism programs presented in partnership with Next for Autism. The all star event will feature stand up performances, sketches and short films by some of Hollywood's biggest stars. That's the night of too many stars this Saturday, November 18th at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific, only on HBO. We're also sponsored by the new film Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri, a darkly comedic drama from Academy Award winner Martin McDonough. Three Billboards is a uniquely entertaining tale of revenge and redemption starring Academy Award winner Francis McDormand, Academy Award nominee Woody Harrelson, and acclaimed actors Sam Rockwell and Peter Dinklage. I saw it already, and it's a great movie. Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri, now playing in select theaters. Okay, let's do the show. All right, folks, let's do this. I have things to talk about. This is where I talk about things. I said I was going to talk about things on Twitter and not not do it there because it's just a, a clusterfuck of toxicity. So this is where I do it. This is where I talk about things. And this is where I think things through and hash things out. Obviously, I'm referring to my friend Louis C.K.'s admission that he did some uh, vile, inappropriate, hurtful, damaging, selfish shit. Some uh, sexual misconduct. Some awful behavior. There was a report in the New York Times, obviously you know about that. And then a day later, Louis copped to it. And cop to it late but he did it and he's my friend and it's a difficult position to be in because i certainly can't condone anything he did there was no way to justify it or there's no way to defend it there's no way to apologize for him about it there's no way to to let him off the hook but there's a lot of concern about you know who knew what when how did you guys let this happen everybody knew this everybody knew that everybody was in on it it's not true. Sadly, I, yeah, I, I knew what most people knew. There was a story out there, I guess going back several years, that there were unnamed people in the story. It took place in a hotel room in Aspen. It was always out there, but then it would pick up momentum at different times. And I would ask him about it. I, I I would say that what this this story about you forcing, you know, these women to to watch you jerk off, what is what is that? Is that is that true? He goes, no, it's it's not true, it's not real, it's a rumor. And I would say, well, are you going to address it somehow? Do you, you know, to handle it, to get out from under it whenever it shows up? He goes, no, I can't, I can't do that. It, it, it'll give it life, it'll give it air, and that that was the conversation. The other incidents, how would everybody know about that? One thing that people don't quite take into consideration is when people do shameful shit, you know, they, they do everything they can to hide it. They, you know, men, women, children hide things for years that they're ashamed of. And if they have to keep doing it, then they, they keep hiding it from their friends, from their husbands, from their wives. People engage in shameful shit and they and they keep it hidden until they get caught. That's what happens. The real problem is, is that female comics have been hearing about this stuff for a while. And there was there was no place where they could go with that information. And I know some of them. And she I, I know Rebecca Corey and she couldn't tell me about this. There was no place for them to go with these stories where they felt safe to tell them. And it's it's fucking sad. So when it comes to you know believing women, I want to believe women, but in this particular instance, there was no one named in that story. There was no place for women to go tell this story. There was no women attached to it. I didn't know their names until Friday. So I believed my friend. It's just that the the environment enabled the dismissiveness of it. How do you, how do I put this? The the work environment 
the social environment makes it difficult for people to come forward and, and be heard, to be listened to, to be believed, and for action to be taken around that. It is pushed aside. It is dismissed. It is framed as an annoyance or an embarrassment. It is used against people. It is used as a threat. That is the structure that exists in life. So, so how do we get that power structure in check? The big step is empathy. Something I have, I, I've had problems with. Empathy. You know, when you have man brain or when you don't, you are not capable of, of empathizing properly with women, which I don't think a lot of men are, and I'm not going to speak for all men, but I can speak for myself. To find that empathy, it requires some sort of vigilance. It requires, you know, really being, not just listening to someone's story or, or listening to something someone says, to actually put yourself in the place of another person. That, that, that requires a little work, especially if you're doing it in a work situation, in a situation where there's a, a power dynamic, in a situation where you're not even seeing a, a person, you're just seeing a woman who is there to receive your garbage or, or to be used as a sexual object or to be diminished or condescended to or dismissed or, or, or pushed aside with your own selfish needs and desires. It's hard to understand that that power dynamic is real and it exists because things have been the way they've been for a long time. Like my friend, <laughs> my friend Sovereign said to me, she said, what it comes down to is that no one should be asked if they want to see your dick when they walk into work. That just thinking about it like that should open up an entire window of empathy to what a lot of women have to deal with every day walking into toxic male work environments it's just it's just a bubbling undercurrent if it's not overt it there it's it's an electrical undercurrent that has always run through society so that's the way things are set up and now when you talk about comedy that world is a goddamn free-for-all it's a wild west show is it a boys club yeah, I, I guess it is. And in, and in terms of my own experience with that and looking back on it, when there are women comics, I'm like, I don't I think women are funny and they've got to be able to fight it out. There was no safe space created for women. There was no special treatment given for women. And then it, it was just sort of like, if you can cut it, if you can make it, if you can rise up out of this garbage that is the comedy scene of what I came up in, then you deserve it. What you didn't take into consideration is all the fucking obstacles that they're up against aside from just that. And my friend Lori Kilmartin actually wrote a very nice piece in the New York Times about that. That, yeah, you know, that was the way I thought. That's the way guys thought. I, I know a lot of, you know, most male comics respect female comics. And they say, well, that, well, she was able to do it. Well, what we don't really, I think, know is just how much bullshit they have to deal with on top of just figuring out how to get on stage and do comedy. They have to deal with all of us, all of the male bullshit that every woman has to deal with in every work environment. There just is no HR department in comedy. There's no place to go to have grievances. It's stacked against you. If you got a male club owner and you got a dude that they're trying to make into a big comic and, you know, he, you know, he says something or does something or, or, or assaults somebody, it's always brushed under the rug or, Hey, man, don't make trouble. Don't embarrass everybody. Don't embarrass yourself. That is the way. It is, and that is not correct. And and look, I'm 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 guilty of it. I had a show of my own on television for four years. I didn't have a woman writer on that staff. I didn't make that happen. I had one one woman director. You know, in comedy, I I don't know really what goes on in in most clubs anymore, but there is an imbalance, and and also just the idea of of changing my mindset or anyone's mindset about women as business. I mean, I'm on a show right now where I'm almost the only man and, and it's pretty amazing. And it's a lesson that I'm learning, you know, for the first time in my life, I'm 54 fucking years old and I'm surrounded by women in a work environment. And it's not a problem for me to behave. And it's not a problem for me to respect and appreciate and have boundaries and be in awe of the people I'm working with. I don't know that it ever was necessarily a problem with me, but I certainly have been a toxic male presence. I've been a very toxic male presence in my life. I, I think I operate now at maybe a 30 to 25 to 30% toxicity level, but I've certainly been up around 90 
in terms of being emotionally abusive, insensitive, you know, angry, selfish, compulsive, you know, and, and completely uh, without empathy to the power structure that exists be- between men and women. I mean, God knows I was in two relationships with women who started out as fans. I married one and, and uh, I was engaged to another one. Yeah, you know, and I didn't fully understand that dynamic. To me, it just felt like, well, this works out because they like me, <laughs> and and uh, and they get me. So my appreciation or respect or understanding of women was was relatively limited to my expectations for a very long time. And it's better, I, you know, it's it's better because I'm older. I've taken some hits. I've thought about things. You know, so, you know, here we are, and I have a close friend who has acted inappropriately. And there are consequences to it, and people are hurt because of it. What do I think about now, you know, about this specific thing, about this power dynamic that just sort of goes unspoken or unappreciated? And I'm saying, I'm not speaking generally, I guess I'm speaking for me. That, you, you know, because I'm a self-involved person or I'm a selfish person, you know, do I not recognize it in my own life? I don't in a lot of ways. And was odd because, you know, when you start to drift as a man into that zone of like, yeah, I don't, I don't see what the big deal is. Just jerked off in front of them or jerked off on a phone. They could have left. They could have done this. They could have done that. You know, he asked. It's not illegal. Yeah, but it's gross. It's creepy. It's massively inappropriate. It's potentially traumatizing. And I had to like, and I haven't talked about this. Like, you know, in order for me to access my empathy, it has evolved over time. And if you listen to the podcast, you can hear it happening. I think we all have the capacity to do it. But I was sort of empathy deficient uh, in a lot of ways, not not just to women, just to people in general, because I was so consumed with my own uh, self-hatred and my own bitterness and my own anger that I just couldn't see past anything. And that sort of slowly started to erode, you know, my lack of empathy. And, and, and I reengaged over time from doing the job that I do, which is listening to people. But this particular thing of the power dynamic and, and, and feeling frozen and in, in, incapable to speak or act in a moment that is, you know, profanely inappropriate or something that you do not want. You know, that's that's one of those things where, you know, a dude will will say, you know, will you just leave? You know, just why don't you just leave? What is it about that moment of paralysis? And I thought about a situation I don't really think I've talked about publicly. And, 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 I, and obviously this isn't about me and I'm not comparing myself to women in any way. I'm trying to access the empathy and the understanding of this implicit and malignant age old power dynamic. So I can grow and help change things. Yeah, this is obviously a fucking massive, turbulent learning moment for men. If you choose to take the education. But going back years ago when I was in college, I, uh, I had a professor, a philosophy professor. I guess I was 18 or 19 years old. And, you know, and I, I really wanted to be smart. I really wanted to be an intellectual person. I really wanted to, you know, to be thought of that way. And I wanted to, to have the goods to do that. And I took this class and uh, it was way over my head. I couldn't wrap my brain around it, but I liked the teacher a lot. You know, this guy was a big, like tall dude, big curly mustache, very powerful figure, very witty, intelligent, understood things good dresser he's just a powerful impactful guy had a lot of impact on me i like that guy and i wanted him to acknowledge me as someone you know who's smart who's you know on the right path who's you know who's gonna who's gonna do it he's gonna give me some encouragement you know be my dad do, do help me out guide me somehow i remember you know, he wanted to have uh, lunch and we went to, we had lunch one time and it was great. You know, we were talking about stuff. He was explaining things to me. He was making things understandable. And I, I appreciated the time and I was a little lost. And uh, and then we uh, went out to dinner one time and it was a little different. He got a little loopy, got a little drunky and the conversation was different. His vibe was different. 
And, you, you know, and I was uncomfortable. So, you know, after that dinner, when, you know, we, I was going to walk home and, you know, he pulled me aside and grabbed me and kissed me on my mouth. You know, did I go, fuck you? What the fuck? God damn it. I don't want this. You know, we, what, what the fuck are you doing? No, I didn't do that. I took it. And I, my body went into like a paralysis. It was almost like a leaving the body kind of moment. And I could not do anything. And once it stopped and I got out and I would politely said, you know, that I'm not, I'm not into that. And, you know, um, you know, okay, I got to go. I felt bad. And, you know, and I carried that, that confusion and that shame with me for a while. And I, and I put it aside, you know, because, you know, I, I, I got through it and it was just something that happened and it wasn't, you know, whatever, you know, it was fucked up, but you know, you're all right. But looking back on that and I am all right, you know, men kissing men's not horrible. It was just not something I was into or am into. And it was, you know, I was young and impressionable and a guy I respected and looked up to, who I was in class with, you know, did that. And, and, and I had to go back to that class and I, and it, you know, it was awful. It, the feeling of going back to the class was awful. The feeling of vulnerability of, 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 you know, not having control over that. And then it, 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 it was awful. So I somehow in light of this, of, of trying to understand what it feels like to not be able to leave or, or to, you know, be, you know, in a position where, you know, somebody you respected or, or wanted um, respect from who you even idolized, you know, takes advantage or, or does something sexually inappropriate. You know, it's, it's scarring. There's, 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 there's no doubt about that. And even if it's mundane, like what I went through was mundane and it's not it's something women go through all the time. There was no cocks involved, but it was, it was a, a disrespect of, of personal boundaries. And I could feel him misreading it. Like he was getting over on me. So, so from me to, to get to that place. And I, and I think a lot of people have been in that place who have been on the victim side of a power structure, you know, even if it's not sexual, the humiliation of that, you can probably tap into it. So, you know, when I got to that place and I read the New York Times piece and then I read Louis' statement about it and, you know, I thought about the women, I, you know, I, I know Rebecca, to move from the toxic male or, or just male disposition of like, what's the big deal? He didn't fuck him. He asked, he just jerked off. It's just kind of pathetic. It's like, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is, is that it's, it's boundary shattering. It is traumatizing. It is unexpected. Uh, it is, shaming and, and if you let yourself feel that if you just let yourself feel what what all those women went through even if it didn't seem violent to you or or like rape or any of that shit just the fact that you know these are people that worked with louis these are the women that you work with like think about it you know think about wherever you work when you make a comment you know even even a minor one look everybody has office crushes and stuff but as soon as you Make it out of your mouth. And that becomes uncomfortable forever. Like these things, they may not destroy your life. They may not even register in the big picture, but they're stuck there. They're stuck there as, as a trauma, as a, as a moment where things change forever and there's a discomfort there. There's a shame there. There's, a, there's an injury there. There's a violation there that you, you, you can't give voice to. Well, now these voices are out and you got to listen to these voices. And you got to understand that. It's respect. And the way forward for us, you know, in all workplaces, 
in, in, in life is, is to make sure that these voices are heard and then they feel that they can be heard. And look, you know, like everybody has made mistakes. Everybody has minor or major transgressions in their life. And I believe that everybody is capable of change. And, and I, I have to believe that. If, if you can't change, if you don't feel like you're changing quick enough, you can, you can behave. You can know enough to behave. And then maybe you'll change. Most people who, who have a heart and a, and a mind, you know, know when they're doing shameful shit. You know, get help because the more secrets you keep, the more malignant it becomes. And look, I, I, I hope this hasn't come off as any sort of apology for anything. You know, I'm disappointed in my friend. He did some gross shit. Some damaging shit. And people are like, you know, well, how are you going to be friends with that guy? He's my friend. And, you know, it's, it's like, you know, now you know, he fucked up. And, you know, he's in big fucking trouble. So, well, what am I going to do? I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be his friend. What do you want me to do? I mean, it's, you know, it's probably the, the best time to be his friend when he needs to make change in, changes in his life. And, you know, and, and, you know, I can learn from it. He can learn from it, I hope. But, but, I, you know, look, I know obviously that what I have to say here in more than how many characters are on Twitter now, you know, isn't going to, you know, please everybody. You know, the, you know people are going to be mad about something. I, I understand. But I mean, my only hope is that, you know, it helps somebody look at themselves somehow differently and look at the situation in a way that's proactive. It's about, you know, it's about the struggle to be better people and make the places we live in and the places we work in function better for everybody. <clears throat> okay, so so I needed to say those things. I needed to say them here. Uh, I think it was the place to do it. And now we're going to do the show. I have a show. I have a show here. <laughs> Uh, uh, I've got Kim Deal of the Pixies and the Breeders uh, the interview we did a, a, a bit ago. And uh, what else? I, I, I should tell you that uh, my friend, uh, my buddy Jeff Ross has a Comedy Central special premiering this week. This isn't a paid ad for it. I just wanted to let you know about it because when he came on earlier this year for the 800th episode, he was talking about it and it seemed like a very ambitious bit of business. It's called Jeff Ross Roasts the Border. And it premieres this Thursday, November 16th. He went from a border town in Texas into Mexico to interview and roast the people who are living through it down there. Undocumented immigrants, law enforcement agents, dreamers, lots of people. It was an eye-opening experience for him, but it's very timely. And I know the whole thing was really close to Jeff's heart. So check that out. I, I'm, I'm amazed that he pulled it off. I'm glad he pulled it off. It's not, when he was told me about it uh, when he was on the show, I was like, how are you going to do that? Well, he did it. Also, I wanted to let people know who follow this show that uh, Buster came back. Buster Kitten came back. I'm sorry if you hear people out in the hallway. I'm in a hotel room in Seattle recording, and I can't really tell them to shut up. That would be weird. It would be wrong to just open the door of a hotel room and go, I'm, I'm recording in here. That would be – I would make everybody uncomfortable. But uh, Buster is back. He actually came back after being away about exactly two days. It was at night. I was in my garage. I was talking to Darren Aronofsky. And, uh, at a, and, and it became sort of a theme of that conversation. When we post that, you'll, you'll hear it. You know, where's Buster? Uh, and then Buster showed up. It was great to, a, a great end to that story. And I grabbed the little fucker and I brought him in the house. And I told him never to do that again. And, you know, cats will listen. So... I want to take a, a minute now to to thank our longtime sponsor, Stamps.com. They've been a reliable supporter of this show for years, and that makes sense because they're a reliable service when you want to get your mailing and shipping done. Mail everything from postcards to envelopes to packages, domestic or international, right from your house with Stamps.com. Stamps.com lets you buy and print official U.S. postage for any letter, any package, any class of mail using your own computer and printer. They were one of our first sponsors because Stamps.com was one of the first things we needed to use when WTF became a business that I ran out of my garage. Stamps.com will send you a digital scale that automatically calculates exact postage and helps you decide 
the best class of mail based on your needs. It's only fifteen ninety nine per month, and you wind up saving money because of the discounts they offer that you can't get at the post office. Right now, you too can enjoy the Stamps.com service with a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus postage and a digital scale without long-term commitments. Just go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in WTF. That's Stamps.com. Enter WTF. So, the Pixies, the Breeders, great rock and roll bands. Amazing. Like, I rem- I'll tell Kim this. I do tell Kim this. I'm going to talk to Kim Deal, and it was sort of a big deal, because uh, I am I was a huge Pixies fan for most of the records, and I, I was a big Breeders fan for all those records. And it was all it was Boston-oriented. Like, I remember them coming up in Boston. I think I missed the Pixies, but I kind of knew... I don't know if I missed them or they were too early, but I knew Fred, I knew people that that Kim knew. Like I worked at a restaurant with one of the breeders who went on to be Belly with uh, Tanya Donnelly. I, it was it's it, throwing muses were involved. Anyways, it was a it was a thrill to sort of talk about that stuff. Go back to Boston a little bit, talk about the Pixies, talk about the breeders, and actually have Kim around. She is a rock goddess, and I'm going to talk to her, and you're going to hear it. Kim will be playing with the Breeders here in Los Angeles at the El Rey Theater tomorrow night. And the Breeders have a new album coming out next year with the full original lineup, so keep an eye out for that. We're sponsored today by Casper, and for those of you who don't know, Casper is a sleep brand that continues to revolutionize its line of products to create an exceptionally comfortable sleep experience one night at a time. And what do I mean by revolutionize its line of products? Well, Casper now has three mattress models, the original Casper, the Wave, and the Essential. Whatever sleep preferences, Casper mattresses are perfectly designed to soothe and cradle your natural geometry. Not to mention the breathable design helps you sleep cool and regulates your body temperature throughout the night. And it's delivered right to your door in a box that looks like it couldn't possibly contain a whole mattress, but it does. I'm telling you, it's a crazy thing to have this box show up to your house and then have a mattress pop out when you open it. It's nuts. It's, it breathes life into itself. It's my favorite part of getting a Casper. Everybody should experience that at least once. I actually just hit my knee when I was saying that. Everybody should experience that at least once. There's free shipping and returns in the U.S. and Canada, but the best part is that you can be sure of your purchase with Casper's 100-night risk-free sleep-on-it trial. After all, you spend one-third of your life sleeping, so you should be comfortable. Start sleeping ahead of the curve with Casper. Get $50 toward any mattress purchase by visiting casper.com slash WTF and using WTF at checkout. Terms and conditions apply. That's casper.com slash WTF. Offer code WTF for $50 off your mattress purchase. Yes. So I, I'm surprised. I was trying to think if I met you in Boston, because I worked at I worked with Tanya at a restaurant. Oh, you're kidding! No, what what restaurant? Edibles. I don't remember on, that. It was up on in Coolidge Corner. Oh, now she's a funny lady. Yeah, she was. I think she was with the Throwing Muses then, and she worked there, and some other musical people worked there. I don't think you'd know anybody, but it was must have been when I was in college. So it was like eighty. Six, maybe? I think I was in, I think I moved there in Boston, 85, maybe. And I think I might have known her then, 86. Right, because I was like, when did the Pixies really break? I think we started playing, I'm pretty bad at this stuff. Yeah, like, because I don't remember, like, I remember it happened after I left, that's what I think. I left in 87. Did What do you consider breaking? Well, I mean, like, I, like, I didn't go to a lot of rock clubs because I was probably doing comedy at the time. But I remember seeing like Buffalo Tom. Mm-hmm. I remember seeing the Throwing Muses. Mm-hmm. I remember seeing a band called Joe. <laughs> I remember, but like I didn't I remember, remember the them. Pixies being around. Were you guys doing a lot of the clubs? Like, did you do the Rat and shit? We did the Rat. We did Chet's Last Call. We did Jack's Chet's Last Call. We did TT the Bears. TT the Bears in, in yeah. uh, Somerville. Yeah. Or, uh, 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 yeah, right there. Yeah. Uh, Central Square ish, Cambridge. Right. Nineteen eighty eight. Surfer Rosa. Oh, see, that's so confusing for me. We recorded it probably in 97. 87. Fucking shit. Yeah. 87. Yeah. And so that means... You were around Come on, Pilgrim out. came out in 80... 
Seven, yeah. maybe. And then that means we recorded it in 86, probably, which means then that I probably, I'm, I've, I've, I probably moved to Boston in 85. That might not be true, though. Okay. All right. Why does it, why does this not, <laughs> why does it not have Come On Pilgrim on the record listing? Well, Come On Pilgrim and Surfer Rosa were import only. Come on, Pilgrim is a mini album uh-huh. that 4AD put out from our demos that we yeah. recorded with Gary Smith yeah. at yeah. that studio that they own. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. We're both losing our memories. It's awesome. I guess it happens now. Man, what's it about called? About the same age. How are you going to edit had... this about us just trying to no. remember things? No, I think it's great. <laughs> and I'm not going to Google anything anymore. <laughs> I'm just going to. I'm going to let it struggle. It had a <laughs> it had a few syllables in it. Yeah. A few of them. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what that would be. Yeah. And it was in a place, like I just moved to Boston from Dayton, from Huber Heights, Ohio, which is a Huber? tiny little suburb of Dayton, which is a tiny little city. So I moved into the big city of Boston. What was that? Like That was like 85? Something. That's like what that? I'm, I'm going to stick 85, with that. 85, 86-ish? Yeah. Well, like, well, okay, so, so I'm just saying you were probably yeah, just at it. the cusp right, right. there. Right. And right. That, and I took off. Yes. Right. Like, it already happened. Like, my uh, the, the bands that were, that were there when I was going to school were like Scruffy the Cat, the Dogmatics. Oh, Positive. Oh, Positive. Yes, yes. Yeah. Del Fuegos. Sure. Yeah. That was before us. Remember the channel? Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. I saw James Brown at the channel. It was oh. kind of sad. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, because it wasn't a big enough stage, and they had, like, carpeting on the stage. Right. And he couldn't do his oh. stuff, so it was kind of late in the game for James. Yeah. yeah. And uh, But, yeah, sure, I remember the channel on, down down by the water. Yeah. But you grew up all in Ohio, though. Mm-hmm. Born mm-hmm. in Ohio? Born in Ohio. And raised in Ohio. Raised in Ohio. My family come from West Virginia. All yeah. of them do. My brother, even. Yeah. He's 18 months older than I am. He was born in West Virginia? Yes. All of them come from West Virginia. Yeah. From the mountains Mm. of West Virginia. The hills? Is that, would you call them Appalachian? Yes, they are (laughs) Appalachian hillbillies. Absolutely, they are. Mm -hmm. They are, really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, What's your brother's name? Kevin. So there's three of you? Yes. And your mm -hmm. twin sister. That's right. So my mother had three children, 18 months and younger. So that was hard on her. She reminded me. Why did they leave uh, Virginia? West Virginia? Yeah. My dad got, went to the, you know, Korean War and then got a uh, GI Bill. And then the G, he went to school on the GI Bill for mathematics. And then he moved up to Wright Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio, married my mother, had my brother, and they moved up to Dayton, Ohio, which was a big Wright Patterson Air Force Base and was hiring. And he was a physicist. Wow. So he worked at Wright Patterson Air Force Base and he worked on the down pilot. He worked on radar. He worked on heat. Heat imaging. Wow. He worked on. Um, and you knew, and he and he would tell you all this. Were you up no, to he speak? didn't say anything about anything. <laughs> you had to learn. He hardly talked later. He never talked to you. No, really. <laughs> How'd you find all that out? At later, I remember his retirement party yeah. we went to, and they did this thing with a heat imaging thing, and I, you know, asked why, and somebody uttered. Dad worked on something like that, so uh, that's all I know. That's all you knew, is mm-hmm. all the retirement party information. Mm, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. he did a lot of important work for the military. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But he couldn't tell you? Did he talk about anything, or just not about work? Um, I don't know. I don't think he was very talkative. No, he liked to sit down at, with his paper, with his newspaper, and it would be one of those, Dad, 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 Dad. <laughs> but my mom was a nursery school teacher, so she, she was, you know... It was, did you have a dad like that? And there were two of you. Yes. Three. Yes. Going dad, dad. Yes, so. yes pretty much. Yes. It seemed like it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But he was good. My dad, dad wasn't home. No, oh. my dad was a, a doctor. He just wasn't there. Oh. And he'd show up very late. And occasionally I'd see him on the uh, couch eating ice cream. Uh, and then it was just like, hey, hey. And then, <laughs> <laughs> and then okay, on weekends he'd yell. He'd, he'd, he'd like, yeah, on weekends there was yelling. <laughs> and then later there was crying. That's yeah. A, yeah, it was a, it was a full arc. Yeah, yeah, that's nice. Yeah, it was exciting. Yeah. So when did you start playing the music? Well, um, you know, we do have a tape recorder of me and Kelly when we were like four years old, and my mom with the super hillbilly voice still. 
because she hadn't lost it all. But she's got this little four, tra- you know, quarter inch reel to reel. Dad must have set it up for her, and she had us sing. Now sang into the microphone, sang, <laughs> and we sing this. Me and her, Kelly, sing secondhand rose with the english accents and everything very oh, you know yeah yeah so i do you know and we're in pitch it's amazing to hear it's like wow that's pretty good so and yeah. i even cough the way i kind of cough now before i start saying <coughs> and like i'm four and i do that it's like i always thought i did that because of smoking or something but i'm four and i'm coughing and then singing so like oh that. yeah so that's nice to know it's a deeply ingrained it's, habit it's, it's, it's prepping yeah yeah and, it's an and, instinct and then we uh, my dad got yeah. a, an acoustic guitar and he decided he was going to learn to play guitar so we went to a guitar teacher and there's tablatures and the guitar teacher hadn't had a folder it looked For like one dad. of his work folders yeah. yes and he had it out there and so i picked up the guitar and in front of dad's chair well he wasn't talking or yeah. listening to anything i was saying he i opened it up and i began playing king of the road uh, that was the first song i learned yeah. on guitar i think i might have learned that too right it's yeah. one of those songs you learn yeah i i did Wait, yeah king, yeah king of the road mm-hmm. yeah da, 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 right da, got the 50 cents <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. There yeah, you go. Yeah. So, um, everyone's clicking. So now, <laughs> so then, uh, and my dad, I, I had a positive experience. My dad said, Look at you, Kim, you can actually play that better than I can. I think that positive experience of like, and yeah. it was fun to actually learn the math of the tablature I found was very interesting. Yeah, so. yeah. And that's how you just picked it up on your own. Yes. Yeah. And your sister, too? No. Nope. And no. my brother didn't either. Mm-mm. No. It's just you. Yeah. Yeah. And then did you like, cause when I learned how to play guitar, my mother used to make me practice with my brother. He would play as well. And we would sit there and she'd make us practice 15 minutes a day. I stuck with it. He didn't. That sounds interesting, but I mean, that's usually from piano. I can't imagine a mother making it. Well, it wasn't it harsh. It was just sort of like, go do it. You know, you like to do it. And then you get into that zone where you're like, well, if we play these three songs, that'll be the whole time. And then we can stop. Right. But I'm glad she did it. Right. It wasn't too authoritarian. Right. That's interesting. But when did you start singing with your sister? I imagine that you guys... Well, when we were four, we had done that, that little time. song. Yeah, we sang... Oh, you- yeah. I mean, when the movie came out, what's the Oliver song? I mean, we would sing along with that. Oh, we would. Oh. All, we were always singing. Food, glory is food. Yes. That one? Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah, I remember going up in a tree, and the, the, the red-headed lady, when she sang, Like hell, I've got my pride, and I would climb up into the tree, and I would actually cuss, and then Kevin went in, my brother went inside and told on me that I cussed in the tree, uh-huh. because I was singing that song. And then they'd have to, did they try to have to get no. you out of the tree? Yeah. No, no, they, nobody <laughs> listened to him. So when did you start, like, uh, like I imagine the relationship with a twin, I can't imagine it. Yeah, were you guys... Inseparable all the time? Do you, I mean, how did that work? Well, oh, you're identical, right? Yes, we're identical. She's 11 minutes older than I am. Oh, she hold that over you? No. Okay. Um, she, you know, we were, I mean, just like sisters, we were all very close in yeah. age. So, yeah, we were very close. But then, you know, junior high school, when the hormones kick in and the shame of it all kicks in, you know, people <laughs> do their all, own thing, you know. The cultural shame. The, everything, yeah. Like free, free-floating shame over exactly. everything. Exactly. One needs their own space to just hide their face in a pillow and just go, oh, my God. So you kind of like. is sucking. Yeah, but, oh, really? You didn't, you didn't dress the same and all that stuff? We did. They they dressed us similar in our younger pictures and stuff, yeah. but no, we didn't dress the same. Because some twins continue that. Yeah. It's kind of wild, right? It is crazy. But then some sisters <laughs> like it, too. Like, they're not even, they're not twins, but they just dig, you know, they think it's fun, so. I guess, but not yeah. you guys. No. Oh, that's good. No. You kind of went your own ways in junior high? <laughs> yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. What were her interests? <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. What were Kelly's interests? <laughs> she likes to read. Okay. <laughs> she really likes to read a lot. Yeah. And <laughs> she likes to nap. Uh huh. And she likes to, you know, lay around. And what were you doing? Playing guitar? Um, yeah. Junior high? Mm-hmm. I was playing guitar then. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. 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 Mm hmm. I had a guitar. Um, not a good one or anything, not in junior high. When did it really kick in as like the thing? Um, when did you start writing songs? I wrote songs when I, I wrote a song when I was 15, but not on guitar. I just wrote it in my head and I showed my dad my song. I sang uh, it for him. Yeah. He was getting ready for work. Mm-hmm. Did that get his attention? 
Yes. Oh, that's nice. And he said, Ugh. That was it? Pretty much. That's not... That's it wasn't just... a positive experience. <laughs> it was like... It's very, di- <laughs> very dismissive. It was the same sort of experience. It's the same thing I got when I was like high on cocaine and I came to my dad when I was like in my 30s and yeah. I had drawn a diagram about how physic, uh, you know, the world will never know physics because I had a diagram with a circle yeah. and a dot in yeah. the middle of the circle yeah. and I was telling him, high on coke. Oh, that, yeah, it's a good time to talk to <laughs> <laughs> to my physicist's yeah, father, yeah. that it will always be unknowable because we're in, we never are able to actually look outside because uh-huh. we're always involved. Kind of, you yeah, know. one of those things. Right. How'd that go over? Same as the song that I sang <sighs> when I was 15. Did he know Same you were on sort coke? Of thing. Did he know you were blasting? I have no idea. Hopefully he did. I used to call my mom when I was on coke all the time. Because I like I was always so positive and no one could bring me down. So I'd call her up and she'd go, how are you doing? I'm like, great! Everything is great! I feel so good. I'm having the best... <laughs> I'd just sit there. She didn't know. My but... son's a creep. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted her to think I was happy. It's his best time to call on Coke. I don't think she ever caught on. Oh, you've really? That's almost sadder. What, that she didn't know? That she th- actually thinks her son is this much of a... Of well, a- it was relative. Yeah, she, eventually she knew when I was out here. Like, there was just... A, you know, it was one of those things. Do you, well, I don't know. Did your parents ever catch you? Finally? <laughs> <laughs> when wasn't I caught? Constantly. Yeah. When I was out here in the 80s and I was all fucked up on coke and not sleeping, my mother came out with her business partner to go to a fashion show and I had to pick him up at the airport and I was late because I hadn't slept. It was like I slept like an hour and I get them in the car and I just reek of fucking booze and and I had to pull over to eat a slice of pizza because I thought I was going to die. With him in the car before? No, with the two of them in there. Like, I'm like, I'm sorry, I just got to, because I hadn't eaten in like two days. So like, you know, when it comes over, you're you're like, I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it to wherever I need to go if I don't need a slice of pizza. And then she knew. <laughs> it was the, was it was she... the pizza that was the giveaway. Yeah. Yeah, but there was nothing they could do about it. And there, there was nothing they could do about no. it. No, no. But that's no. like, that was uh, that was the first time. Yeah. <laughs> it, well, that was the first time? The first time that I got, yeah, that I got caught. I got clean so many times. I used to be, you know, holed up in my house in, in Dayton. Yeah. And I wouldn't answer the door and I would lock the door, and they had keys, so they would come in, and he would just like, Kim, you're fucking up, you know. It was really sad, you yeah. know. And then I would start chaining the door so they couldn't, you know, they could always break it, but they're not going to do that. And I remember my mother okay. took her lipstick, and she drew a smiley face on my front door with lipstick and uh. said and wrote out, I love you, exclamation point, exclamation point. And I opened the door and probably snarled at it or something. <laughs> but, you know, I... I wish I still had that because my mom has advanced Alzheimer's now, yeah. so she doesn't talk and she doesn't really stand up very well. You know, she yeah. can do a couple of steps. Yeah, but she, um, it would be nice to have that still on the door. You know, yeah, yeah the lipstick. Well, that mm, was yeah sweet. I mean, what, yeah. at what? Point? It's all sad though. You know, the disappointment. <sighs> yeah, but it, but the love is not sad. Yes, that's true. That's very true. You, you yeah. know, like uh-huh. it, there is a the, the disappointment and you know, uh, hearts broken and whatever. But that was her sort of like she was just letting you know. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's very touching. Yeah, <laughs> it is mm-hmm. it's choking me up. Yeah. Wait, like at what point was that? Oh, just one of many on the way. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Not near the. But well, you were living in Ohio. Had you left and come back? Um. Well. Uh, you mean from Boston? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was the only... The band only stayed in Boston, like, for... I got a divorce, so the reason I even went to Boston How wasn't theory anymore. I think... Mm, yeah. Okay. Now, I think I might have gotten married maybe 1984. That's a guess. Yeah. It's a stab in the dark. Yeah. I know I got married. Yeah. It might be... Did you know the guy? 1984. <laughs> he worked with my brother at the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, or he, at a, contra- a defense contractor <laughs> for the people at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. So you knew him. Yeah, he's a friend of my brother. Work, worked with him. Yeah. But I didn't know him for that long before I got married. And then we ended up moving back to Boston where he was from. Oh. And so that's why I was in Boston. No shit. I'd moved back there with him, yeah. The guy. Yeah, uh-huh. 
How because long were you he married was only, for? He was only he was from he was born and raised in Boston. Yeah. He went out to, to do some, dip, you know, they you know do tra you know the um, there's a word for it. It's uh, something about traveling and something about consulting, I guess, uh-huh. um, for defense, for defense contractor yeah. for Wright Patterson Air Force Base, and then a subcontractor, and then he was yeah. going to head back, and so we headed back to yeah. where his job was to Boston. Mm-hmm. All right, so let's yeah. let me just put this together, Charlestown. So- Charlestown. Yeah, before it was nice. So you're in you're in Ohio. You're going to junior high. Then you go to high school. Mm-hmm. When do you put the first uh, rock outfit together? It wasn't really a rock outfit. It was just me and Kelly going out to clubs and and playing our guitar. This is like these the are, Indigo Girls. No, these are, well maybe <laughs> these are weddings. Yes, we know Annie's song. She, Kelly can sing a good rose. I did Annie's song. Kelly, why are you laughing? This is my life. This <laughs> and then pretty great. Kelly did. Um, there's a song Where's called. That record? There's a song called the wedding song. Yeah, yeah. And our friends really liked us to uh, like to yeah, hear us sure. play and stuff yeah. and harmonize and stuff. Yeah. So they would ask us to do it. We did a few of them. Yeah, never people we didn't know. There were always people. How, how long? How big know. was the repertoire? Um, for weddings, you don't do that much. Oh. But. So you we, weren't the wedding band. You were the special. We sort were of at like, the wedding. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, we weren't the wedding band. Yeah. No. Then, okay. Before that, though, yeah. the first time I ever sang a song in front of anybody yeah. was Car Wash. The Car Wash. That's yeah. it. What, where, where, where would you do that? <laughs> <laughs> we were... Yeah. I think 16. We yeah. were too young to be in the bar. Yeah. Moe's Lounge. Piqua, Ohio. Yeah. There was a band, a disco band that performed Yeah. at Moe's Lounge. And it was a family band. Five people in the family. The yeah. two sisters were going to have babies they wanted out. So they needed a replacement <laughs> to do the harmonies. Yeah. So me and Kelly bought... Tops that were the same, identical tops. Yeah, disco tops. They had long things. They yeah. were they were arty tops. Okay, you know, yeah, they were for for dancing and singing, sorta. Yeah. And we had the hand. We tried to do something. Yeah, it wasn't really. It wasn't figured out like the Temptations or anything right. like that. But we could clap. You know? Yeah. And then we did harmonies, and I was to take the lead on the car wash. This was an audition? Mm, no, this was the night. We had already done some rehearsing and stuff, and this is the first time I sang in front of anybody. My friend Greg Martin was a heavy metal drummer, and he was the drummer for the outfit. Yeah. And I remember looking at him like I'm looking at you now because yeah. the audience is here. And right. He's the drummer. And I had the feeling of dread come over me, and I looked at him, and he was the last person I looked at before I turned around and started singing in the car wash. You might not ever get rich. I don't know. <laughs> I don't. Ha- I just blurted out. I have no idea how it went. It was. It was. Horrible. Men bought yeah. us a lot of slow gin fizzes. Oh, yeah. Well, that's, that's, that usually means it went okay, or maybe not. Maybe um, they no, was- they don't. They don't, I don't think yeah. that's okay or not like, okay. Look at the sixteen-year-old girls. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. they were. Yeah. yeah, and we could sing okay, so yeah. I think we did okay. I don't know. It didn't. It wasn't a career. We did it for like a couple months. You, you know, did we- many gigs with them. It was always at Moe's Lounge. I think that means that they must have been the house band. Sure. And looking at it, we did it, now, it for a while. Maybe, maybe two months. Wow. You know, I don't know. And then, do you we remember? Did a few show- yeah. What other songs? We did Oogie Boogie Oogie. <laughs> I don't even know if that's the name of it. It could be close to that though. Oogie, oogie. And I know that he did um, the what? one where you repeat the song over and over again. Bill Withers wrote it. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so they, I don't think there was anything on that. We didn't do anything on that one, and <laughs> that's great. Yeah. So then after that, we did. We got you know. I would save up money. We would get a board um, for our sa- our Christmas presents and stuff. We got a Yamaha a board. Yeah, you can play it out live. Although it didn't really do what I thought it was going to do, but I still have it. We still use it for rehearsals today. Um, what do you mean? It's well, a mixing board? No, it's no. live PA. Oh, oh so okay. that we could okay. take it with us, right. and we could Hook me and Kelly. Up to it. 
Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah, okay. And and we could um, take it out to the ground round. Yeah. Do you know what a ground round sure. is? Ground okay. round. I lived on the East Coast a while. Yeah. So four <laughs> sets. You put your peanut shells on the floor. You know, four sets at night. And then Joe's is a fish house, and we would mix in original songs with the covers that we were doing. This was in Ohio. This is in Dayton. Yeah. And this is mm-hmm. the two of you. Mm-hmm. This was now we're like. Are you 18, both playing 19, guitar? 20. Just you playing guitar and she's singing. Most I'm playing guitar. Okay. She had a bass guitar, and she played bass on a couple of numbers. And this was ground round the steakhouse. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's nice. So you're the lounge act, in a way. Oh, uh, This was more sort of, I don't know if it was loungy as much as it was like Loggins and Messina-y. Oh. Sort well, of. Well, no, I mean, I mean, that was, you were in the lounge part. You were in background music. Yes, it wasn't a, It wasn't a show. That's right. It's, it's like the two girls at the, over there. Four the, sets a night. You yeah. do it through the background for ambience. Now, right. are, there, are there recordings of this? No, it was before phones. Before. <laughs> Why'd you just cross your <laughs> I'm thinking God above. <laughs> no yeah. recordings of it. <laughs> yeah, no. Mm-mm. So, like, so this is in high school. This is in high school and right out of high school. So yeah. we would, yeah, this was... Yeah. Okay. So, when do you, when do drugs start folding in? When do they not fold in? <laughs> um, there, I mean, there's 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 sections. Yeah. Where I was succeeding. Yeah. And then sections where I wasn't doing so well from various substances. Yeah. And things. Yeah. Like yeah, smoking yeah. too pot, too much pot yeah. or drinking too much. Right. And, and those get juggled throughout. And right. There tries to, as I try to balance, finding yeah, the come balance, up, coming, coming up with sure. a, something that's going to work. Yeah. The mythical balance. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah mm-hmm. Like everything's going to be okay. Just enough to make it good. Right. But okay, so do you go to college? Do you do you have a regular job? I try to what go to happened? college. I go to Ohio State University. Yeah. Um, spectacularly unsuccessful. Completely emotionally immature. Couldn't find my classes. Didn't know there would be a map for them. I was in Lincoln Tower. It's like eighty thousand people lived in that building, and yeah. it was next to another tower where like eighty thousand. I don't know how many people live there. Um. Like 16,000 or something lived there. I don't yeah. know. It was a lot of people that lived there. Maybe, yeah. Yeah. And, um. Yeah, 80,000 a lot. But I, I but, <laughs> but yeah, a lot. 80,000 went on the campus. Yeah. But or yeah. Or even went to the games. Big freshman dorm is what you're saying. Yes. And I could even look out and see like the stadium where all the people would go. Yeah. yeah. To the game. Yeah. The football game. Ugh. And just like, I. I Wrong I, place. I have no idea what I was doing. So I did well in the first semester, and I just I just left during the second semester. Was your sister with you? No, was she that was sad? doing something else. No, uh, uh-uh. it was just sad. Not because she wasn't with me; it was just sad. Yeah. But um, I took a French class my yeah. second semester. I I didn't speak French. Yeah. But I don't think you're supposed to take a French class if in college if you don't speak I, French. You no, know, I didn't. I don't know if that's true. I did that because I had to because it was you? a requirement, and I. And I got, I tested out of it. I, I claimed to be too stupid to learn a language. Because there was a language requirement for the liberal arts degree. So you didn't test out of it, you tested under it. That's right. <laughs> yeah, I did not know how to speak. <laughs> I was not going, it was not working now, for me. Now see, that, that's brilliant. I don't know how you did that. <laughs> well, you, they offered you this incompetence test. It was a very embarrassing thing, but I couldn't, I just couldn't study. I couldn't fucking deal with I couldn't do this the studying. I couldn't find anything. <laughs> yeah. I liked school. I graduated yeah. with honors. I enjoyed it. I did it. too, but I don't remember doing a lot. <laughs> <laughs> right? Did do you... you know what a TA was? I didn't know what a TA was until many like decades later. What's a TA? It's a teacher's assistant, right? Oh, yeah. I remember them saying something about a TA in in yeah. college. That's what they do. They help you. Oh. Uh, yeah. So did you finish at college? No. Oh. No. You did no. good in high school, though. Yeah. 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 You went to a lot of colleges? I did go to a couple of them. I, I you know, I, I went to Wright State. I didn't graduate. I went to Sinclair Community College. I didn't graduate. Now, I did go to Kettering College of Medical Arts, and I graduated. It's a two-year associate degree, and I enjoyed that very much, run by Seventh-day Adventists. Adventists. Yeah? Yes. What was the degree in? Um... It was medical technology, and oh. I really liked that. Did you get a job in that after that? Yes, I did. I enjoyed it very much. What was it? What is the job yeah. like? Well, I mean, what was the job? Well, you 
well, back in the day when I was doing it, you stand in front of the culture counter and the smack machines, and they're just you get these samples, and yeah. you put you just feed the the samples of serum or blood through the machines. Yeah. But I, you know, you also plate microbiology. Yeah. That was cool, and there was a specific bacteria that smelled exactly like juicy fruit, and I liked that. The worst one was the. Um, not the stool samples, yeah. the worst one, and not the sperm. I used to count sperm to see if somebody would be infertile, but the worst was the sputum because you had to go to the cheesiest part of the specimen yeah. and get a swab and then plate that and see if anything grew out of it. And then you would throw some um, antibiotic discs on it to see what it might be resistant to, and then you wrote the report and sent it to the doctor. How long did you do that for? A few years. I really enjoyed it. But wow. then I ended up moving to Boston. Because your husband, who you loved? <laughs> yeah. Well, why'd you marry? get married? I don't know. A lot of people ask me that. I did the same thing because you felt like you had to. I cried all the way down, all the way down the wedding aisle. You were He's like, a nice guy. You cried all the way down the wedding aisle. Sobbed. My dad walked me down. It's I sobbed uh-huh. all the way down. It was it's horrifying. Fucking poor guy. How, how, I don't know how long, I did it? How long had you been with him? Oh, four months. Oh, really? He's a great guy, and he's got a wonderful wife I've met. And they got a nice family? Yes, I all love right. his it, family. It all worked out. I love his family. It's so sweet, and they love me. Yeah. It, it probably worked out for the yeah. best. Yeah, so, and whenever we uh, go play Boston, sure, he I'm, always comes. He always comes to the show, sure. and I know his kids. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah I'm sure he's, he worked out best for him. Yes, it totally did. <laughs> Completely. You, whatever happened, you did him a favor. Yes, definitely. <laughs> so there's no disrespect to that. None, yeah. Yeah, but you, that's you, how that's how I got into a Boston though. Yeah, and so, but that's like, and in, and in and how did you get involved in the rock scene? Well, now in Dayton, Ohio. Yeah, back in the day, and I don't know now. I'm yeah, not sure. Dudes didn't play with girls. They also didn't play with gays <laughs> either. With the rock, gays, yeah, rock bands wouldn't have a gay person. Not or, not an out gay person. Right. Yeah. Not not with them knowing. Probably. Right. Maybe they knew. I don't know. Sure. And they wouldn't play with the girl right. either. I mean, I rock like bands. rock music. Yeah. Yes. Now, uh, the other, you know, pop music's totally different. You yeah. Know? But um, I like rock and roll, hard rock, rock. hard yeah. rock and roll, yeah. where you're actually gonna think you're playing hard. Who were your bands growing up? Who'd you love? I liked Sabbath. I liked Zeppelin. I'm the typical. I liked the News of the World. Um, Tony Rock Queen. Hard rock. Yeah. yeah I yeah, grew yeah. up in New Mexico. Yeah. Yeah. Sabbath, yeah. Uh, Zeppelin, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. ACDC. Not so much them I didn't like. They were oh. okay. I didn't like the guy's voice so much. Oh, okay. Yeah. That guy could play guitar, though. Yeah. Okay. I don't Sorry. know. They were okay. I'm, I'm for me. Gonna, I'm just for me. I'm not going to argue with you. I mean, I think you're wrong, but yeah. uh, I never say just okay, but <laughs> it's, look, it's, you know, each of their own. It's music. <laughs> A lot of people like Kiss too, and I really wouldn't like them. I mean, I didn't like them. I didn't. I'm on board with the mm, no Kiss. Okay. I have no problem with not liking Kiss. I have no problem with not liking Rush that much. I have no problem with. <laughs> yeah. I liked. I liked. Um, all the world's a stage. I okay. liked that. I, they're fine. You know, yeah. we grew up with it. There was a yeah. lot of you know bad rock. There was good rock. Mm-hmm. I don't like people that classify Led Zeppelin as prog rock because I don't see it as prog rock. I'm not a prog rock person. I never heard that. Yeah, somebody once said that to me, and I'm like, that can't be. No. No way. They're like, incorrect. Yes, they, they are. They would be wrong. And what about the infusion of, of punk and new wave? When did that happen in your area? <sighs> uh, didn't town? happen. Didn't happen. Not the original time that it happened. A little later. It never hit. No. So if it didn't really hit then, it really didn't hit. Now, you can say that, like, I don't know, like when somebody in Huber Heights heard something kind of punky. Yeah. I don't know. You know, punk missed, or I graduated high school in 81. When did you graduate? 79. 79. Right. So, like, I remember, like, it somehow in 81, my high school, they skipped punk and they went right to New Wave. Right. That's how that happened in, yeah. in Wayne High School, too. Right. There was no punk scene. No. I did see somebody with a two, with a safety pin in his cheek, cheek when I went to Ohio State University. Right. Fall of 79. Yeah. Yeah. And in college, made a little more sense. And that's the first time I heard anybody talk about the AIDS virus, where there was something going around, and there it was something about gay. Uh-huh. Something; those two words were in the same sentence. That was seventy nine. First time I heard that. Really? Yes, I don't know why. 
when I went to when I was in Ohio State University in seventy nine, yeah. I um worked cleaning the toilets at the Agora Theater across the street. Mm-hmm. And that was your only job? No, I also toilet? washed dishes in oh. the tower, Lincoln Tower. Oh wow. Right. Yeah. So um that's where the guy in the safety pin was working in the bar at Agora Theater. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So, what was the Agora Theater? It was like a like plays. It was yeah. a place where the bar, where bands came. Judas Priest came with the bike, Speaking motorcycle. Speaking of gay front men, <laughs> yeah, I think he even got booed off the stage, and it was his show. It was so weird, and but nobody we knew he was gay then. No, I mean, yeah, it right. was yeah. It was just yeah. And they, then I saw the Joneses sisters too. The Jones sisters. I don't uh-huh. know if you know they're the they were kind of from the Pointer Sisters sort of popularity. Oh really? Wow. And then there were three beautiful ladies yeah. with r- huge nails, gorgeous nails. And I'm cleaning the toilets, and I said, "Wow, those are nails. How do you do anything with those nails?" And she said, "I don't really do anything but sing." <laughs> I went, wow. That's cool. Uh, and you're standing there just in your toilet cleaning outfit. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So. But so no, nothing infused. There was like no, like you know, records sneaking in. When did you start to get hip to the new sounds? Um, actually, there was somebody who went to the coast and then would send us, send my sister music back, and that had um, thirteenth floor elevators on oh, yeah. it. It had Black Yuru. It mm-hmm. had a lot of Costello. It mm-hmm. had. Um, on cassette, yeah, the undertones. Mm. That's a full range. Yeah, pretty good range. Yeah, James Blood Ulmer. Yeah. Oh, really? Mm. Okay. Um, <laughs> you remember that? You are you remembering the the actual the box, the cassette? Almost. Box? It's yeah. played that much because back in the day before internet, yeah, if you lived in a small city yeah. when there wasn't anything like a fanzine or anything like that, right, where there was no record store, yeah. you would actually never hear about anything. So you really had to pass cassettes, <laughs> yeah, and that was the only way people would be turned on to new music if yeah. they got a hold of a cassette. I love that about that the way that worked. I talked to a lot of people of our generation mm-hmm. who went on to do uh, more uh, RT music, and they all kind of got it that way. Yeah. Like, you know, either like there'd be a guy in town that booked these bands that no one heard of. There was a circuit like mm-hmm, that, mm-hmm. like punk bands just sort of going with people who read fanzines and coming into play, right. that whole thing. Right, right, right. I, I, I thought, I think that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Tastemaker, a curator sort of yeah, for yeah, a, yeah. one dude. Yeah, yeah, right. You remember that guy in Boston, Billy? Oh, he's dead. I know, I know. Yeah, yeah, Ruane. Yeah. Yeah. He was sort of that guy, wasn't yeah. he? Well, he looked like that guy. He wanted to be that guy. I don't know. Boston a, was so big, though. Billy Ruane, there's a doc about him. Someone yes, made a there doc is. about him. Uh huh. Him on a motor, bo- his moped. Okay, so that's how the music fed in. So when you get to Boston, you get into the Pixies. How does that happen? And how do you that do you invent that sound? Well, there was there is wasn't really a Pixies at the time, but I can tell you how I met David and Joe. I met David and Joe. Because when I moved to Boston in yeah. January, there was a paper called The Phoenix. I remember The Phoenix. And one of the fun things to do if you were into music and, yeah. and you know, were judgmental like I was or whatever, yeah. is like you would flip to the very back of the page and look for, for the personnel ads because they were always the re- most ridiculous ads for bands. I did the same thing when I was in, I mo- was in L.A. for um, the Olympics and I grabbed a paper and looked at the same thing and like the people will say that you know i think it was carmen apache or whatever you say his name was looking for a young out in la it was a 20 to 22 year old blonde mid back shoulder length uh, hair blonde hair down to the mid back and they were looking for the specific look and so it's it, it's interesting you know for a band yeah, to put a band together. I mean, there were really crazy things. Yeah. Like people, you know, and people are super, um, like, no sense of humor, super, you can just tell that they're just really uptight, like, must have proper professional attitude. We, we have a van. You must be punctual. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that, you know. It, it's oh, it's always sort of this weird thing, like oh, look yeah. at another one. And I just, I was doing the thing where I always do it. I'm yeah. in Boston. I mean, I had, I have a, I had a studio back in my house. I had a, an eight track 
um, half inch um, Tascam. In Ohio? Yes. And I had my own studio. I made my own cords. I soldered my own cords together. I had a patch bay and MXR 32 band equal, like my solo music. You know, I had an, a DX Obenheim drum machine that I would build the beat, you know, b- the beats Just around. you or you and Kelly? Me. Kelly would help, but I, but it was mainly me. What kind of music were you making? Just uh, my stuff, you know. But it was interesting because, uh, like, having the Where's DX. Where's that stuff? Where's that record? Where's those recordings? I don't know, actually. Come on. I don't mind those. There was Death Bats in the Belfry. That was an awesome one. Death Bats all around me. It was funny. But it yeah. was, it was, I liked that one. Um, so you were doing that. You were, did you do a lot of songs like that? Yes, it, all the time. Were those tapes? All the time. I don't know. Are they in the basement of your parents' house? I don't know. No. Uh-uh. Uh, right. No, okay. I don't know where they okay, are. Okay, fine. I'm not going to pressure you. Um, I know they're going to turn up somewhere. I hope so. I'd love it. Um, so you're doing a lot of that solo work. Yeah, anyway. So I'm, you know, and I bring all the gear with me to Boston I think I did. I think I tra- packed my eight track. I know I had it. My Oberheim DX. Yes, I did have yeah. it. So when I get there, one of the first things I do at work is I get the Phoenix and look at the back pages and look, start looking. And there was one ad that stood out actually that I actually called. Yeah. Yes. Mainly because I thought they sound like a, a couple of cool people that I could yeah. like hang out with because right. I don't know anybody. Yeah. And they were talking about. Uh, liking Husker Du slash Peter, Paul, and Mary. Mm. Right. And so the dudes back in Dayton would never do anything like that. No. You know, have yeah. any cool idea of, get, you know, wanting to Yeah, play. those are two cool things, but they're very yeah, different than each other. Yeah. 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 And so it, was, it makes sense. Yeah. And it was, I think, for maybe bass playing, it might have even said, or guitarist. I'm not really sure whether. Yeah. And then, and it said something like, no chops. No chops. No chops. They don't want you to have that any chops. That was the hook. That was it? That was a hook. Because it's funny, like no chops. It's like they're not the, you know. Not looking for a pro. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, exactly. You know. That's great. Yes. No chops. So I called him up. It was the only (laughs) ad I called. I'm your girl. I got no chops. (laughs) And I was the the only person who called them, evidently. (laughs) I just found that out a few years ago. It's just a city full of guys with chops, I guess. I know. People can get very, very, you know, yeah. in the personal as they can get like that. I think in real life, maybe, maybe not That's so beautiful. Much. Yeah. I love it. No yeah. chops. So That's then a tag. I, yeah, and I visited them in their apartment, Joe and Charles, and they didn't have a band or anything, but it, it was nice to meet them and stuff. And and what happened? And we started hanging out and... Playing? You know, not really right away. Not really. No. You know, you talk about playing <laughs> yeah. and like yeah. Charles had an acoustic and he played some songs. I don't, I didn't know what Joe could have played bass or guitar. I think he was on the fence about one or the other that he wanted to play. And, yeah. And I had, um, you know, me and me and Charles split the fare and had my sister fly out uh-huh. to see if she wanted to drum. Yeah. Because she knew how to play drums. She took lessons and she had a Roger set and stuff. So. No chops? And not very many chops, no. <laughs> yeah. So, but she said no. <laughs> so um, we got somebody else. But you did fly her out? Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah. And then she ended up staying? No. no. She went home. She didn't want to do it. So she went home. So we got some guy f- who lived in Medford. Medford. Yeah. Medford. I forgot his name. You did? Yeah, we got some guy, and we practiced in Charlestown in the basement, me and... He didn't end up being on the record? No, uh, no, I yeah. know, yeah. Just some guy? Some guy. I forgot his name. It's all right. Yeah. Anyway, we, we, we practiced with him for a while, and then he quit. He didn't, he didn't think, I, th- I think he didn't think we were rock and roll enough, actually, you know, because cause Charles was doing a lot of acoustic and stuff like that, and uh-huh. we were, you know, had a bit of a, you know... So what was it that... That the process of of sort of making that sound and making those records, I mean, I guess it's a hard question to ask because they're so unique, and it seemed like all of you were you know contributing to your to it. It didn't seem like it was single handed in any way, right? Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> those are. Did you like those records? Those first couple of records? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We practiced a lot. I mean, uh, then, you know, my 
my husband worked, had worked at Radio Shack when he was younger, mm -hmm. and he knew a guy there, David Lovering, yeah. and ha had worked at Radio Shack, too. He, I met David. He came to the wedding reception, so called David and asked if he wanted to come and play with us, uh -huh. me and David and Joe. And he said yes, and then, and then he kept coming back. He's the and drummer. Then, and then he's the drummer that we're playing with, and now no we chops. have... He was probably, out of all of us, had the most chops. But he has a great story where he tells where he, the first, one of the first gigs he ever went to when he was playing live with his other earlier band yeah. was that he had brought one pair of drumsticks to the show. Yeah. And that one of the sticks fell through the stage and he only had one stick for the rest of the show because he just didn't think to like bring a couple. Another of, set? Yes. <laughs> it was it's pretty funny. Yeah. So those bands, so it took like how long for that to start to wear down? What? <laughs> the relationship of the Pixies. Oh, let me see. Well, we weren't, we did Come on Pilgrim, yeah. Surfer Rosa, Do These are Little. like such monumental records. Yeah. They're so good. Yeah. And then you just, it turns to garbage. Well, it really didn't at first. I mean, it got, it just, the bonds became looser. It started kind of that way. Yeah. I mean, one of the reasons I did Pod was because me and Tanya were hanging out in Boston, and... I love that record. Yeah, that's yeah. great. Thanks. So, I know that Kristen was pregnant at the time. Yeah. So, she wasn't playing. Kristen Hirsch. Right. Throwing muses. Right. I'm doing that to make it, sure people know. That's great. And then Charles um, went on like a, a tour um, on his own as a solo artist going out and touring. Is Black Francis? I don't know. Oh, I'm not yeah. sure. Okay. And and so he wasn't around either. So me and Tanya would play together and um Ivo, the owner of four A D, that guy call uh, called and said, You guys are have songs? I go, Yeah, we're playing together, you know, yeah, we, we we can we can go we can have a song that goes from beginning to end. We've got a few of them. Yeah. We can make more. Yeah. He said, because I would like let me have you hear the demos. And so we, we made demos and sent it to him, and then that became Pod. And that became The Breeders. Yes, yes. And that name is from where? I liked it because I thought it was funny that gay people thought it was disgusting. Vaginas were disgusting. And it's just interesting because, you know, there's a whole group of people who have their own kind of intolerance and like they're, sure. you know, they find something, you know, yeah. you know, gross. Yeah. Because you hear all the time guys think that, you know, being gay is gross and gross. And then yeah. they're, they got, you know, breeders. Yeah. Right. Gay people think women breeders are, gross, are gross. gross. Yeah. Or whatever. Yeah. It's, it's or just babies and pregnancy and all of it and it is kind of gross so but it's the way it is yes it is, it is. it's natural so it that's is. where that's where that comes from breeders yeah and that, and i like horror movies too so i'm i'm partial to that name anyway because it is that the name of a horror movie the brood oh the brood. but there was a breeders like a few years ago yeah mm -hmm. and so you and tani did that first record mm-hmm and it was who else was on there? Josephine Wiggs, who's oh, a bass yeah. player now. And she was on. Uh, she was on the first two two records, or all of the records. She was on. Yeah, she was on. Pod, and then there was an EP called Safari, Safari yeah. and then Last Splash. Yeah, yeah. Safari's and, great yeah, too. Yeah, yeah four good. song EP. Yeah, yeah. Who's and the she's on the new player? one. The violin player was in a band called Ed's Redeeming Qualities in Boston. I remember Ed's Redeeming Qualities. That was the What's violin her name? player, Carrie Bradley. And she played a lot with you. Yes, yeah, she played on Pod and a little bit in Safari. Uh -huh. And then she ended up moving to San Francisco, and we recorded in San Francisco, so she's on Last Splash as well. Right. She went on tour with us um, during the Last Splash tour. Isn't uh, it nice having a violin player on stage? Oh, it's so nice. It really classes the joint up. It sure does. Her playing does, yeah. Uh, that's it does. great. Yeah. So... What's your what's the relationship with uh, Steve Albini? You know, I had him in here. Yes, he texted me after he was done with you, and he said I said some really nice things. He said about uh, you. he said you're the real deal. She's a real like great musician. She's a yeah. real right. Like he just yeah. He like out of yeah. everybody, that's a guy that's recorded yeah. everybody. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You're the one. Yeah, yeah. What do you make of that? Well, I love him. Don't I? <laughs> I do. I do. I love him. Yeah. I well, love Heather, his wife, too. And, and like, but did did he do Last Splash or he did the other three? He did the other three. He did Title TK as well. And he recorded some of Mountain Battles and so, uh, just a lot of solo stuff that I do. I, you know, I do with him. 
Let me understand the relationship with it. Like and amps. He did with the amps. I couldn't find that fucking record online. Yeah. yeah. I wish I had it. Mm. I want it. Yeah. Now I got to go to the record store and find it on vinyl. Look. I don't think. I think it's out of print. Of course it's out of print, but like you can go dig for that shit. Yeah, I got a yeah, bunch yeah. of been buying records yeah. lately. Yeah. Why don't you reissue it? Yeah. Okay. Who is? I, is that on four eighty? Yeah, four eighty. Yeah. What? It's it's vinyl time again. Yeah. Kim. Yes. Get him on it. Yes. And there's a Bob Pollard song on there that I didn't know there about? There is. I, he had two. I went down with him. He wanted me to produce their next record. <sighs> He's so, an Ohio guy. Yes, he is. I didn't want to produce their, rest, their next record, but he said, I love your guitar sound. So I said, well, why don't you use my amps? So I drove <laughs> down to Easley in Memphis yeah. with my guitar amps. And I don't know. That and was... so, and and he had two songs that he wasn't using. So I took one piece out of this and one piece out of that, and I put them together. Oh, okay. Yeah. You liked them. I liked those two sections of those two songs. Well, what kind of guitar <laughs> amps are you using? I was just using Marshall's C, the JCM nine hundred, the nine hundreds. Yeah. You just like the way they break up. Yeah, I do. Yeah. 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 So, talk to me about the relationship between uh, you and and a producer like or Albanian specifically because. You know, everybody loves that guy, and he's a real purist, and he's a real kind of, you know, analog, hands-on dude. Mm -hmm. What What is it like that? What is that? How does that work, man? Because I, I don't, I'm not clear on it. Right. Help me out. Well, the thing with Albini that is good philosophically, what's yeah. cool about him, is here's the same thing that's cool about him and that's hard to work with him. Yeah. If you suck, that's the way you're going to fucking sound. Yeah. Because you suck. Right. And that's how you should sound. <laughs> and I will make your sound sound as good as possible while you're sucking. <laughs> and th that's kind of like, so I have to make sure that when I bring anything there, he's not going to, he's not, you know, the band-aids that I was telling you about, like use a distorted vocal and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. There's a lot of different band-aids that I can use if something isn't working or something doesn't sound cool enough yeah. for me. And none of those are up for grabs with Albini. And, you know, he could probably. He don't want him. I mean, I mean, it's not, you know, he'll say it's not my record. It can, you can make it suck all you want. Do whatever you want to do. I'm here. You're, I'm a service. I'm a plumber. Yeah, I know. I know. Screw yeah. it up as much as you want. Right. But, you know, there's a thing. I mean, he's, you know, he's, here's what kills me is that as I'm convincing him that I need to redo this thing, this vocal thing where I obviously didn't hit the right pitch on this one thing. And he tells me it sounds good, and I'm like, no, I have to redo it. I'm, I'm, I, I've got to get that note that that's just too weird, and I'll redo it, and it'll be better the other way. For whatever fucking reason, it sounds better the way he said it was, uh -huh. and that's what kills me every time. He's always right. Uh -huh. Yeah. But you you challenge him, and that must constantly. Be. Yes, and he's constantly. Yes, we can do it and waste time and go down this road like we always do, Kim. Or you can just let it go because it's not going to sound any better. No, we've got to fix it. Okay, let's do it. That's what. I yeah, that's pretty much. That's pretty much what it is. Did he record the new one? He recorded. I mean. He recorded a bunch of my solo stuff, so I've been working with him a lot. But the New Breeders album, he recorded two of the songs drum-wise, uh -huh. and that's it. And boy, can you tell the difference when his songs come on. They're just like fucking killing it. Why didn't you do more with him? Because he lives in Chicago, and the drummer still has a day job. And for him to take off the time to like go up to Chicago to do it is kind of a big deal. Yeah. So we had to keep the budget. Uh, yeah, we even mixed in Pro Tools this time. That's a big. It's a big deal. It's my first time. Well, is that a concession for the for the other guys? Yeah, for Josephine and Kelly. Yeah, yeah. But, they, but they, you, is it something you're going to do now? Cause no, I'm, no, no, hmm. no, no. Because you're kind of like against that shit, right? I think it makes it sound funny. I think that p digital and Pro Tools and tc anal analyzers and, yeah. and 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 vintage limiters yeah. all those algorithms i think they work really well on computer generated sounds yeah. and and the urban and the pop and the edm i think anything any like like you know people don't really use drums yeah 
and guitars. Yeah. They might be, it's actually like a keyboard pad that sure. they've tweaked out to maybe sound like it could possibly be the smash of a guitar. Right. Who knows what they're using? Yeah. But I think all of that stuff sounds good in a Pro Tools realm and it's all great. But I think it's. You it's, mean if it starts in fake land, it, it's, it's. You can use any other yeah, sort of right. fake crap on sure. it and it really just sounds great. <laughs> but if you actually have like, a C12 and you're singing in it yeah. and there's no auto tune then to actually start to smash it without without preparing it to suck and be yeah. fake not suck but just yeah. to be fake yeah it really doesn't work well oh i i still don't so think either, so you, either you stay real all real or you stay all fake i feel like that's best for me <laughs> and for my ears yeah. yeah well that's all that's all good information so for me, it's exciting to hear you talk about it. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And in this, like, it's it's weird because I listen to all the records, um, like in, in preparation. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I do that, but I do it because it's not going to help me talk to you any better. Right. But I, I just want to get into the zone. Mm -hmm. And then it's sort of interesting to, to hear the arc of things. Like Pod is very, it's almost folky in a way, right? Isn't it? Right. Yeah. <laughs> With you, you both sing on it, don't you? You and Tanya? Yes, a little bit. She sings a bit. Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. And then, like, and then Last Splash is like all in. Mm -hmm. And then, and then the title TK, mm -hmm. that, that's got a little bit different than Last Splash. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's still kind of high. It mm -hmm. feels kind of high. And then the one after that, uh, that, that one seemed a little submerged. Yeah. Yeah. Battleship. What is it? Mountain, Mountain Battles. Yeah. Was that submerged? It sounds submerged. <laughs> it does. It's, I don't know. It's sort of like listening to The Idiot. Do you know to Iggy Pop's album? I know album? the album. What's, up, what's on it? Uh, Night Clubbing oh, and uh, yeah. the Dumb Dumb Boys and um, uh, well, uh, Calling Sister Midnight. You know, like there's that Berlin painkiller right. sound. They're just... <laughs> Him and Bowie are just high in the darkness of, <laughs> no, you know, still walled Berlin. Um, so I see, that seems like it would be the amps one. We're mount, we're mountain battles. I was t completely sober as you a were? judge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh wow. Yeah, but the, there's well, maybe a, that's why you needed to feel high. I don't know. There was a flat response on it because of the mastering issues. Oh my God, it's a uh -oh, nightmare for uh -oh. me. The I'm mastering is so to, horrible nowadays. It's I didn't so mean awful, to bring so. it up. Then. Yeah. You're sober on that one. Yeah. But yeah. the amp's no sober. Way God. Zonked. <laughs> yeah. And How I was that it. record? Huh? Do you hear it? I you can hear it when I'm... Re yeah, we're going to do a couple of songs on the tour. Josephine has kindly said, yes, I will play these songs. So she's playing a couple was of... Was it a bad time for everybody? Um, it was... For me, it was a lot of drinking. Yeah. Yeah. That's mainly it. Just drinking and pot smoking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Beer. Oh, really? Yeah. Your beer? Yeah, I liked it. Mm -hmm. You're a beer woman. Yeah, I did like it. Yeah, mm -hmm. Alice mm -hmm. Cooper had Alice Cooper in here. He was a beer guy. Was he really? Yep. Oh, his Pollard. I think Pollard's a beer guy too, yep. isn't he? Mm -hmm. it's yeah. Beer. Yes. It takes a lot. It takes a lot. <laughs> you know when you there's no way to hide your alcoholism when you're just a beer drinker and you're showing up at places with a case or two. Yeah, it's a lot of work. It really is. Uh, oh yeah. well, well. So how long you been sober? My last drink was in 2002. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. And last time I smoked pot was in 2002. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. I had some back pain, some uh, back issues. Uh -huh. So it kind of, I went wonky oh, for yeah, a little yeah. bit oh, there. Yeah. But On now. The painkillers yeah, and whatnot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it starts normal and then it's like. That's, hey. always, that's always what brings people. That takes people out all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, good, man. It's yeah. great. Yeah. You mm -hmm. feel, and how's your sister doing? She's doing really well. Yeah? Yes. So she's going to tour? You guys are going to tour? Yes. Yeah, we're touring. So this is really the original uh, Yeah, this is lineup. the tour of us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No Tanya. No Tanya. No. They just reissued her, that belly record, I think. The yeah, second one, I think maybe. so. Yeah. Star or something like yeah, that. Yeah, they reissued Star. Yeah. Did you know she won a Grammy? Oh. I didn't know that for the longest. Like, I just noticed that. For it's what? Like, Jesus for Christ. For Star? Yes. I didn't remember. She is a Grammy winner. Huh. You worked with a Grammy winner. At a restaurant. Yes. <laughs> I hope she's doing all right. I listen to Throwing Muses sometimes. I thought, I, th I listened to a couple of their songs recently, and it's really great. Isn't it? Yeah. Hate My Way, I really like. They used that for American um, Horror Story, the uh, first season, and it was very effective. Wasn't was that great really when cool. just out of nowhere, they're just going to use your song and you get the publishing? You're like, sure, I'll take yeah. that money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Well, it's great talking to you. I'm glad you're well. Thanks. Did we nice cover everything? To you too. Do I have everything? I, like I wrote a little bit of a sheet here, but I guess. Um, oh yeah. Well, we talked about that. The real and the fake. That was sort of getting into that all wave thing. Right. Right. Yeah. It wasn't supposed to be a thing. I mean, it really wasn't. But then all of a sudden, it, people thought of it as an all wave technology. It's like well, no, the, the concept I, became like you. You were ahead of the curve on it. Right, that like that there there is a competition. There are people that believe all analog is better. They're liars. Why? (laughs) (laughs) There, nobody does analog. I'm sorry, nobody does analog except for Jack White on occasion. He actually might do analog. Actually, he does. He might actually. Yes, that's his trick. Yeah, but think how zonked out somebody has to be to actually. I mean, you're going there to think about it. Like people that you think are. Analog aren't analog. Nobody does analog. It's no, no. You can't do tape, is what you're saying. No, well, you can use tape like an analogizer. Yeah. You can throw your stuff through tape and then have it caught on a computer later on to yeah, actually. Right. But that's not a. That's, that's not, not an analog, analog recording. And you nobody should. cares. And it's all good. In the end, it's fine. However, anybody wants to get their stuff up. And in and, and the end, when the speakers play, it really doesn't matter. You, you should go do one of those live to acetate things down at Third Man. Yeah, I saw that. I saw that. They're okay. They're hit or miss. (laughs) No. They're hit or miss. Right. It's like there's something about like, you know, really recording something, you know, over a couple of shows. Like some of those straight to acetates that he makes where it goes live to an actual plate. Like, yeah, that was cool. And then they had the, the sand ball, the sand. Oh the, no! Not that thing. Right. That's the that's oh. the nineteen twenties thing. Yeah, you know, he does that's shows. What I had to, I just saw. Oh, no, I, yeah, that, oh, yeah, that's kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's mm-hmm. no, you don't need to mm-hmm. do that. But no. he'll mm-hmm. he'll record mm-hmm. regular through a modern yeah. mixer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but go right on to the you know make acetate during the right. show, but yeah. not with the. That's 19. pretty cool. It is cool, but if there's a hiss or buzz, oh, you mean li- be on there. like regular album, like yeah. regular acetate? Oh yeah 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 uh-huh. yeah. yeah 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 yeah. But no second tries, no do overs. Right. Yes. Like there's they keep. Keep it. I think that we were going to do that. It's like, well, we keep the rights to it. It's like, oh, okay. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, right. right, Uh, right. I think so. Because the ultimate painting one, I swear, has a buzz, like through the entire record. What's ultimate painting? Their band. Oh, I never heard of them. They're pretty good. They're kind of kind of Velvet Underground. I never heard of them. Feelies like really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're good. They're pretty good. You don't keep up with the new stuff. Well, I guess not. I don't remember a lot of There's people a lot, talking man. about them. There's a lot. Things. Maybe no one's talking about them. People send me a lot of records, Kim. Oh, yeah, I bet they, they do. send me records. Yeah. But uh, but I do like them. And I'll show you their records if we go in the house. Okay. Thanks for talking. Thank you for having me. Kim Deal, folks. Legend. And don't forget, John Stewart returns to TV to host a live comedy benefit for the HBO special Night of Too Many Stars, America Unites for Autism programs. Presented in partnership with Next for Autism, the all-star event will feature stand-up performances, sketches, and short films by some of Hollywood's biggest stars. That's Saturday, November 18th at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific, only on HBO. I'm in a hotel room. No guitar. Boomer lives!